Article 5 today. Uh, we've got these printed out in the back if you want to follow along. Also back there by those other information uh, is our sheet that kind of tells you what the Articles of Faith are. We've been walking through that. We are finishing up five. There are ten Articles of Faith. Uh, and this morning, we're going to really emphasize the last eight words uh, of Article 5. Uh, two, three weeks ago, Owen talked about the love of what is Article 5. Article 5 is the work of Jesus, what he does. We talked about who Jesus was, but now we're talking about the work of Christ, who he is, what he does, what that means to us as followers of Christ. Christian means little Christ, the follower of who he is. And then John, the week after that, talked about uh, the, the, the gospel of, of, of the Jesus, how the, the goats, the scapegoat that takes away the sins, and we have the goodness given to us, the righteousness given to us by Christ. And so this week, we're going to finish up Article 5, and we're going to spend the last thing on those last eight words talking about um, uh, his atoning death, victorious resurrection, constitute the only ground for salvation. That's what we're going to talk about. Resurrection, the only ground for salvation. Well, Joel, isn't this, isn't this the Easter message? Well, yeah, in some sense it is. But in some sense, the Easter message is the message of the Bible. In some sense, we preach the Easter message every single Sunday. We are always preaching the gospel. We are always preaching that Jesus came for the sins of the world and he resurrected that we might have new life and we may spend an eternity with him Resurrections are where we talk about so much in Christianity and so much in the world, but yet we don't necessarily spend the time to think about what does it actually mean? What does it actually imply for us as Christians? Yay, Jesus rose from the dead. That's exciting. That is absolutely glorious. But that has impact for us right now, impact for us today. And so we're going to spend, we're going to hop around a little bit uh, in the Bible, but one of the verses that I want to talk about right away comes from Hebrews chapter 7, and it's in verse 22. And there's a word in here that I want to spend time talking about right away because it's a word that I think the world has made into something that it's not. So Hebrews 7, starting in verse 22, and it says, This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. This makes Jesus the guarantor. And the word I want to talk about is guarantee. Guarantees a word that we, I think, has really got a bad, it's almost tainted. It's almost tainted now when we think about the word guarantee. Because when I think about guarantee, I think about infomercials. I think about guarantees that are slapped on things all the time. Okay? So this week I was looking for things, and, I, and one of the infomercials that comes back to me from my childhood, nostalgia, is something called the Banjo Minnow. You guys remember this commercial? It came out in 1994. You can find anything on the internet. This is, I googled the Banjo Minnow and it had all, you can watch the YouTube commercial. It's a four minute commercial. That is a long commercial. And it's called the Banjo Minnow. And in there it's talking about, it's got real lifelike flickering action. And it's got this old fisherman and saying, he's like, I've guided for 45 years and this is the best thing ever. I have to prove to people, I guarantee you it will catch you more fish. And I'm sitting here, eight, nine, ten-year-old kid thinking, I need a banjo minnow. I know exactly that this thing is cheap. I know this thing has been mass-produced. I think that I know I'm being absolutely suckered into something that I don't need, that isn't really going to work that well. But they're like, it has real-life action. Oh, it does have real-life action. It's made with glitter, so the fish will be attracted to it. You know, I probably would catch more fish with that. And it guar it's guaranteed to catch more fish. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I need. That's what I need. And so I followed the rite of passage of an American boy and I got suckered into something I didn't need. That's what happens. Because I was, it was guaranteed to do something. And so I think the word guarantee, Jesus is the guarantor. He's the guarantor of a better covenant. He's the guarantor of something better. I have, that word stirs up something wrong in me. It makes me think of something like, that doesn't seem right. That seems too good to be true. That doesn't seem like it fits with what's going on in the world. I don't necessarily say he's the banjo minnow, but it's something about that says, but yeah, okay, but yeah, maybe, but guarantees don't mean much anymore. They don't have the weight of what they used to do. 
And that's what I want to talk about. What, the, what does the biblical word mean when they use the word guarantee? Because he's not using this lightly. This is not a word used a lot in the Bible. And I, when, I, when, I, when you think about the word resurrection, I want us to associate the word guarantee with it. Not cheaply, not infomercial guarantee, not fake type of tainted type of guarantee of sure, yeah, whatever, but I'll never get through to customer service because no one will answer the phone type of guarantee. A guarantee is only as good as the person who makes it, right? That's, that's the key. This makes Jesus the guarantor, guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. All the priests before Jesus died. But his priesthood, he holds permanently and continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost. That's a, that's a neat word, the uttermost. How can you be more than saved? How can you be more than conqueror? How can you be saved beyond something that you're already saved from? I think the Bible continues to imply again and again and again, yes, you're saved. Yes, you understand salvation. But yet there is a more understanding to be had about how much Jesus has actually saved you from. Those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. We get, we're taught in school, at least I was taught, to look for those words, always. Those, those words that are absolute because, you know, that's you take a multiple choice test, you see the word always, you know that's wrong. Because nothing is always there. Nothing is never there. Nothing is never. The Bible does not use words incorrectly. The Bible does not use words accidentally. The Bible does not use words lightly. He is the guarantee who saves to the uttermost, and he always makes intercession. This is a person who makes a guarantee, and is a person who can keep it, who can hold on to it, who can do what he wants with it, because he is the one who makes it. Is there anyone who can make a better guarantee? Is there anyone who can make a better promise? Is there anyone who can make a better seal on what he says he has done than Jesus? No. The resurrection has a lot of meaning for today. It has a lot of meaning for us today. It's not that Jesus was dead and now he's not. It's not that Jesus went through all this thing and then he came back because, well, he's God and he can do that type of stuff. It is a symbol of things to come, of things that matter, of things that change in who we are today. It is the seal. We're going to read about what Paul says about this in just a little bit. Uh, so, okay, we've read there. Now I want you to flip. We're going to spend most of our time in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I like this chapter a lot. If you're looking for chapters to uh, earmark, because uh, one of the questions that I ask people, um, I like to find out, and I ask people just in general is, if you were to give me a passage, if I were to ask you right now on the spot, What's the gospel? What would you say? What verse would you go to? This is a verse that I think we should have on our short list. Uh, 15 is a long chapter, but these first couple of verses are really neat. Uh, Paul is writing to a church in Corinth who is having belief issues. Okay, they're having all sorts of issues. Corinth was a very wicked church, a very worldly church that wrestled with lots of different sins. But in this chapter, Paul is specifically addressing the belief that some people have like about what they believed about the resurrection because the resurrection is this foreign concept we they were expecting the messiah to come they were expecting the messiah to conquer the romans to lead them in in, in military conquest to be his great political leader and here comes jesus saying uh, we must die to ourselves so that we can live we must love our enemies we must turn the other cheek who lives this radically different life of love and it's just and grace and preaching the gospel he came to save people who were lost people who were sinners he turns the world kind of upside down, and, and then all of a sudden he's doing this miraculous thing. He's having people following, people giving up their lives, their jobs, their careers to follow Christ, and then he dies. There was a little bit of, of chaos, a little bit of confusion, I suppose, in those three days. I can't imagine what the thought would be like, even though Jesus again and again and again says, I will be turned over, I will be killed, but then I will raise again. And then the resurrection happens. And you think everything was upside down then, there, there is no right side up anymore. Jesus has absolutely upended everything that we knew. 
It's not that he came preaching just a radical message of love and grace. He says, and then I will prove it. And then I will show you the seal. And then I will show you how good this actually is. Because who is a better guarantor than Christ himself? So verse 15, Paul is addressing. He says, now I would remind you, brothers of the gospel, that I preached to you which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. That's, that's a lot of then, now, and still going to continue to be. The gospel continues to impact our lives every single day. Not just the day I said yes to Christ, but the days today I say yes to Christ, and then tomorrow when I say yes to Christ. Uh, and if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance. First importance. This is, was the most important thing. When I got there, this is the one thing in the whole world that I want you to know more than anything. This is important. This is it. That which I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Paul is addressing questions about the resurrection by going back to the scriptures and going back to what the gospel is. This is, this is foundational because this, this is so important to what we believe. The resurrection isn't this piece that's like the happy ending to the Christian story. It wasn't that Jesus came and died and our sins are forgiven and we may be with him in, in heaven forever. Oh yeah, and then guess what? He also is not dead anymore. Isn't that great? The resurrection is, is an essential part of the gospel. It's absolutely essential. It, it, it is the seal. It is the, the final proving ground. It is the final completion act of the gospel. That when Jesus did die and he was in the grave for three days and he did come back to life, it's like saying, this, this isn't just another person. This isn't just someone who's got a radical message. This is separating out all the other religions and cults and other things in the world where their leader does good things and has good ideas but then is dead and stays dead, Jesus, who is the creator of all things, says, you, death can't even contain me. That's how powerful this is. He goes, the, the thing of death, the thing in this world that is inevitable for every single person. I had a, a, a preacher uh, back in my childhood who said that the death is still one per person and it's always inevitable. Death, there is no way to avoid it except Christ. Death cannot hold him. And why is this so important? Why does this prove so much? Because he's saying, I actually can back up what I say. I actually can show you that what I say is actually true. Because here's, here's the first part. The first implication of this is that Christ actually accomplishes what he says he does. He doesn't just do things in a super cool way. He does what he has set out to do. He says, I have come that you will find forgiveness and grace in my sacrifice, that you may have new life and have it abundantly, that you may live with me forever in heaven eternally. This is just the things he says, and he does a lot to prove that. But then when he resurrected, he says, now nothing can disprove that. Nothing can change that. That is the stamp of approval. That is the done deal of our salvation. How can you de-resurrect Jesus? It's, it's a ridiculous thought, and it is for a reason, because you cannot. It is done, it is sealed, it is forever accomplished. When he rose up, there is nothing more to do. He has defeated the one thing in this world that we cannot defeat, that we cannot change. With all the medical technology in the world, people still pass away. But in Christ, he defeated that. He completely accomplished it. So imagine this. If we were to, if I were to put you on the spot and to say something, okay, so there's a, you have to put all your possessions, you're in this world, weird jam, you're held at gunpoint, whatever the situation wants to be, and the guy says, you are going to lose everything in your life, all of your family, all of your possessions, all of your vehicles, your money, your household, everything that you have is going to be completely gone unless... These two options, there's door A and there's door B, unless, and this is a ridiculous example for a reason, the person behind one of these doors can do a 360 windmill jam, dunk. Absolutely ridiculous, okay? Just bear with me. And door A opens up, and it's a five-year-old. And we're thinking, I'm done. I'm, I'm absolutely done. And door B opens up, and it's LeBron James. I'm going to go with option B. 
I think it's pretty obvious we know this is the done deal. There is absolutely no comparison to, is the five-year-old going to do it? No. Is, the, is he going to be able to do it? 110% of the time. There is no question about this. It has been done. It is accomplished. And if I can even stress this even more, my example, as ridiculous as it is, isn't even big enough to encompass what is on the line with the resurrection of Jesus. It's not just my life. It is my eternity. And it's not even as big as comparison as a five-year-old to LeBron James. It is a, I, I can't do anything in my power to do anything to add to this. But yet Christ, and all of who he is, and all of what he does, and all of what he says, has accomplished it, and even more so when he defeated death and resurrected. I have accomplished it, and there's nothing more that you can add to it. There's nothing that anyone can take away from it, and there's nothing left to defeat. All we have to do is live in hope and in victory. That should change a little bit of our perspective sometimes. I mean, I don't know about you, but as a Christian, sometimes I feel, I feel because of the news and the way people talk in the world that I'm just trying to survive. That, man, I'm just, I'm just a Christian and I'm trying to be in this world and the world is oppressive and it's all around me and, I, and I'm trying to share my faith, but I feel scared because I feel like people are going to judge me. And I don't want to be that guy. I feel like that's, that's, that's a bad mindset to be in. Because we are not in the minority. We are not the person who's, who's trying to survive because if someone finds out about our affiliation, they're going to seek us out and they're going to make us feel uh, not right. No, no. Part of the resurrection is Jesus is the creator. It says he's the one who was the firstborn of creation in Colossians 1. He was the firstborn of creation. By him and through him, all things were made and all things continue. That's a powerful role when Jesus says, I was the creator and everything in this world is run by Jesus himself. And yet Jesus himself comes to earth, becomes flesh, and dies so that he will defeat death, the one thing that we can't do anything about, and sin, so that we can resurrect. And he's saying, I am not only the creator, the one who is firstborn of creation, but I am the firstborn from the dead. I came and died and lived again so that you might not just live and die, but that you will live eternally. That's the creator. If there's any person who can say, this has changed, it's the person who holds the world in his hand. That should affect the way we live a little bit. Who's actually in charge of this world? Who's actually in charge of the things that happen in this world? Who actually is the king of kings and the lord of lords? Because we we're very quick to say those things, but sometimes we're very slow in believing that actually in what the world and what the news and what things and people say. That is a lot of meaning when he says when he resurrects. Because he is able to back up what he actually says. And that's pretty, pretty powerful, pretty potent. Okay, skip down with me. Uh, we're going to hop around a little bit because 15 is well worth reading in the entire chapter, but I don't have that much time. So we're going to skip down to verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? There, there are people in Corinth, there are people around saying, well, that's great, maybe someone can raise from the dead, but, but, but I don't know if Jesus did. You know, it's, you, you believe that guy, and he, he's preached some really revolutionary things, and this is, this is the problem I have with some people who are like, oh, Jesus is he's only, we just got to love people, and we got to do our best to love people, and that's how we're going to change the world is through love. Yeah, love is an important part of who Jesus is, but when we change the world by the mission of Jesus has saved you. And Jesus' resurrection is what does the power. That's what puts the power into what we're preaching. Otherwise, I'm just preaching this idea of, of mushiness. <laughs> Jesus actually puts the power, puts the potency in the gospel. Saying he saves, and he did save, and he saved himself, and death couldn't beat him, and he only raised from the dead, and he's going to defeat death. That's, that's a lot of power in that statement right there. How can, how can we say that? Here's the question that I want to ask people too. So we have other resurrections in the Bible. We go back just a few chapters in the Gospel. You have Lazarus, the dear friend of Jesus who dies. He spends three days in the grave. Jesus comes, weeps with Mary and Martha, and says, Lazarus, come on out. Lazarus raises from the dead and come on out. So what is the difference between the death of Lazarus and the death of Christ and the resurrection of him? 
Lazarus comes back to life, and Jesus comes back to life. So what's, what's the difference? Because there is a big difference here. There is a significant difference in the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of Lazarus. Lazarus dies again. Jesus defeats death forever. There's a, there's a big difference in what that is. This is a temporary resurrection. This is a temporary healing. Jesus is an eternity of life and life with uh, love and life with Jesus and life with God. There's a, there's a big difference. What, what Jesus went through and what Jesus comes back from is something that we look forward to as Christians. Jesus and who his humanity is, two natures. Remember, Jesus is fully God. He's fully man. He comes back fully man, fully God still, but in the new body, the, the heavenly body, the body that we look forward to. The things that is done to Christ are the things that we get to look forward to when we get resurrected in the final day. How our bodies will reflect that. How our bodies will be glorified. How our bodies will be changed into that likeness. Now, will we be Jesus? No. Jesus is another level, but we will be like that. Um, so Paul is addressing this right away. But if there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And here's, this is... This is important. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. You can't have the gospel without the resurrection. That's, that's, there's hope in the gospel. There's beauty in the death of Christ. There's forgiveness in the death of Christ. But there is eternity and hope and life and the permanent seal of an accomplished deed done in the resurrection. This is why Easter is so, so, so important to the church. Not because it's this cool miracle that happens in the church. Because it is the final seal of the Christian's life for eternity in the arms of Jesus. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God because of the resurrection. There is nothing that can separate us. There's nothing that can snatch us out of the hand of who the Father gives to Jesus because of the resurrection. That's why Jesus can so confidently say the things he does in the Gospels because he knows I will be resurrected on the third day and there's nothing that can change that and there's no one that can affect that. That is a permanent, powerful statement because without that, then we're all just placing our bets on something that seems like a really, really sure thing when reality is Jesus is hope. He's our living hope, is what Peter says. And it's the hope that will not and physically cannot fail because he has already defeated everything physical and he is supernatural. Supernatural. Um, for it says, picking up in 16, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life, we are all people that must, uh, sorry, we are all, of all people, we are most to be pitied. Most to be pitied. There, I talk with a lot of people. It seems like just, I like to talk to people, and I love airplane rides, and I love public places where I can sit down and have a conversation with people. And I kind of have it in because inevitably, what do you do when you talk to someone in the first five minutes? Says, hey, well, what do you do for a job? And I say, I'm a pastor. And I've told you before, it's either going to get really, really quiet, or <laughs> it's going to get a really, really, really interesting because I don't know what else is going to come up. But a lot of people talk about what they believe and what they have faith in and what they, what they think is the most important thing in life. And the answers are absolutely diverse and broad and, and wide. And there's so many things that people say. And it's, and it's so interesting to hear why people think the way they think, why people believe the way they believe. That's, that's what I'm so interested in. Is at the end of the day, what are, you, what are you putting your faith in? And people are always just, well, I'm just doing my best. I just, at the end of the day, I just try to do the best thing that I can and put my best foot forward and I just be the best person I can and try to do good when I'm not supposed to, you know, do more good than bad. And I just, and that's, that's like that's the end of the conversation and they've exhausted their spiritual depth of, of having conversations about emotional things. And I'm sitting here like, you're missing the entire point. You, your whole life is trying to do good and trying to not do bad. That, that's, that's missing the entire point of, of, of the resurrection. That's, that's putting all your bets on the five-year-old. Well, I, you know, I'm just going to do the best. He'll do the best he can, and he'll jump as high as he can, and man, you never know. Miracles happen. This is not going to happen. That is not going to happen. But yet people continue to do that. That's what I'm going to do. That's, 
and when you put it like that, it's, it's ridiculous. And so I've got to be careful when I talk to people because I can get frustrated with that because I'm trying to, I don't want to point out their flaws because you get an airplane, I have to sit by them for two hours. They can't move and I don't want them to be mad at me <laughs> until maybe like an hour and 59 minutes into the conversation, but that's another, you know. But having the conversation about what, what is actually the gospel about? Why do we actually do the things that we do? Why do we actually live the way that we live? Because it's, it's the conversation. Why do, you know, it's, the thing that I hear a lot is when I tell people about Christianity and I tell people about the gospel, the, the common answer I get is, it can't be that easy. But that seems really easy. Or that seems too simple. Well, why are you making it overly complicated? Why are you trying to make it more than it needs to be? It's not because it's simple doesn't make it wrong. It's not because it's simple doesn't make it simplistic. It's Jesus came and died a death and he was perfect in who he was and he was God. In that death, he made a way, he took our sin on the cross and that we have no more sin for those who believe in him. He takes our sin away. That's what John talked about with the scapegoat, the goat that runs away, the sheep that's gone. He has carried away our sin forever. And now... He gives us, in the resurrection, He gives us the, the power of not turning back to sin, the power of living for eternity in a new life, and the power to have His righteousness. He gives us His good standing, His perfectness, so that when God looks at us, He doesn't see me just as a neutral being, or me as a sinful person, even though I continue to mess up. He sees me as, Jesus has given you His status. Jesus has given you His life. Jesus has given you His righteousness before a holy God so that now we can stand before him not ashamed, not in fear, not wondering did I do enough good things. It's I do good things because I know that my life has been sealed and found in the resurrection. And there's nothing nothing, no one can change that. So then our lives should look a little different. It's not about am I trying hard enough? Am I concerned about what I'm doing? Am I living a life that's... Am I, am, I, am I trying to do good? You know, am I examining my intentions? No, my life has been completely found in something that cannot be altered or changed. Now my life is a life of, of joy. Now I didn't say it's always going to be happiness, but it's a life of joy. A life found in Christ and the things that He wants to do. I do things not out of requirement or out of prerequisite. I do things because I want to follow Him. Because He has done something that, can never, that will never be done again. That has never been even comprehended in the minds of the disciples. If you go back to Mark chapter 9, Jesus has the transfiguration, a mount of transfiguration. He glows and he does and becomes holy and he shines and the disciples are ooing and aahing and Moses and Elijah show up and they're having this great time and he comes down the mountain and he says, don't tell anyone about this because I'm going to be delivered over and I'm going to die, but then I'm going to raise again. You know, you can't, I, I imagine what they were thinking. Imagine what they were saying. They're coming down the mountain. You just saw this incredible thing you've never seen in your entire life, the most majestic thing ever. And he says, oh, by the way, I'm going to die, but I'm also going to raise to life again. And the disciple says, what? What did he say? Do you know what that means? No. Do you know what that means? No. Should we ask him? No, I'm terrified to ask him. And that was the end of the story. They were too afraid to ask him what it meant. So I'm wondering what was going through their minds when he's hanging on the cross, he's been dead, and they bury him. Are they going back to that thing? You don't think. You don't think he... Do you think he meant do, what he said? That thing about coming back? I don't know. What's going on? There's a lot of stuff in this world. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of chaos. I mean, I don't... Do we, do we put our faith in something like this? Because he, he, did, he did a lot of things, and he said a lot of things. And then on the third day... Can you, can, you, can you imagine the mixture of emotions of, of having Mary running to the disciples saying, He's alive. I've seen Him. He's alive. And can you imagine, maybe there's the mix of hope of saying, He, he did what He said He was going to do. He, he did it. He actually did it. He wasn't just spoofing us. He wasn't just telling us things that were, were to make us feel good. He actually did what He said He was going to do. Think of the validation that has about everything we just read. <laughs> Everything in this book takes on a whole new level of meaning because it's not just empty words. It's not just good advice. It's life-changing, supernatural, altering of eternity things because of the resurrection. Skip down. 
much time do I got? Okay, 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown in a natural body. It is raised in a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. This is, this is a fantastic hope. Fantastic hope. Because there is... because. Right before I got up here, guys, here's my confession. I had to go take ibuprofen because my hips and my knee hurt, and I don't know why. I'm getting to that point. I'm not that old, but I don't know why it hurts. But I had to do it because my body aches. I look forward to the day when I will be resurrected in a spiritual body. I look forward to that day when it will be different. I look forward to the day, in some ways, I'm not looking forward to death, but I know that in death, this old body is going to be put in the ground. I don't care if it decays. I don't care if it gets burned. I don't care what happens to this. Because it's, it's not going to be the same when it's resurrected. It's going to be renewed. It's going to be remade. It's going to look different. It's going to look, I, I don't know, it's going to look the same, but it's going to be different. It's going to, all I know is it's, it's going to be remade, and it's going to be better, and it's going to be great. It's going to be great. That's, that's, that's part of what this is. It is. This is a perishable body. But notice the word that Paul uses. He uses the word sow. You, he's sowing something. What are you sowing? You sow seeds. You don't sow seeds to bury seeds. And you say, oh, great, I buried my seeds. Now nothing else is going to happen. That's ridiculous. We've got enough people in this town that are familiar with agriculture. When you sow something, you want it to grow. It's going to transform into something else. We sow our perishable bodies. And because of Christ and his resurrection, when we are dead, we are sowing our bodies in the ground no matter what state they're in. And when Christ comes back, and after we're dead, we go to be with Christ, our spirits be with Christ. But after Jesus comes back, that second coming, our bodies will be raised up again and remade with the entire world. It says in Romans 8, what I read for our introduction this morning, all of creation is groaning in anticipation of being remade, of having sin expunged and taken out of this world so it is no longer in decay and chaos and brokenness. But everything will be remade better than the Garden of Eden. It will be better than paradise. That's what I look forward to. That's the hope we have, that those who have passed away before us, that when we go and we pass away, that our souls are kept with Christ in heaven, and that our bodies will be remade when they come back in the resurrection again, because of the resurrection of Christ. He was the first one to do that. He's the first one to come back and have a totally different, the heavenly body, the spiritual body, the imperishable, unable to die again body, where we can live with Christ for an eternity, forever and ever and ever and ever. It's amazing. Keep, uh, skip down again, because this is it's just cool. We're going to go to verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Well, there we go. We must be transformed. We have to be transformed. Nor does the perishable inherit the, per the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. And when we hear the word mystery, we get frustrated in the Bible. The word mystery is incredible because in the word mystery is, I'm going to do something. God's saying, I'm going to do something so powerful that if I try to explain it, you in your human minds can't understand it. When you read mystery, that's what I want us to think about. Think of God is doing something that I physically can't understand, but I'm going to trust that God is doing something incredible. Uh, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable body must, be, uh, must put on the imperishable, and the mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. That's a specific victory. That's not a victory of Joel walked 72 ladies across the street in his lifetime. That will not matter. This victory is Jesus won. Death is swallowed up in victory, and that is our victory for those who are in Christ. O oh, death, where is your victory? It's, 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 it's hypothetical, almost a mocking question. Death, the inevitability of this world. We're all, we're all going there, unless Jesus comes back. We're all going there. Death always wins in the end, kind of, except for those in Christ. 
Death, where's, where's your victory? Because Jesus has defeated it all. Jesus has defeated the undefeatable. Jesus has won. He's conquered the last enemy. I may die in this world physically, but I will live eternally. That's, death isn't going to be remade into something else. Death is out. Death is done. That's a victory. And they ask, Oh, death, where is your sting? Where is your sting? He's putting things in perspective. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to the day when I pass into eternity. Because I'm sure it may be painful in this world. That's not the sting. The sting of death is the sting of a life found not in Christ. The sting of no life eternity. The sting of a death found in a place of hell. But for us, there is no sting. That's powerful. Death has been defeated. I don't even think I can comprehend that fully. So, Mariel?